This happened when I was in the second year of junior school. I live out in the countryside, far from the cities, and my little town is surrounded by the mountains. This is quite common in Japan. When I was in elementary school, my friends and I would go to the mountains to play. It was amazing. We would go any chance we would get, like after school. My friends and I would run home, get changed, and then head up into the mountains. We would do things like catch bugs, build secret bases, play games. We would come home caked in mud and totally exhausted. Those were the days, huh? But then as you grow up and you move through the years at school, you end up being interested in different things. For example, video games and sports clubs. You stop playing outside so much. Well, that was the case for me anyway. Until one summer in junior year. I don't know if it was because we were feeling bored or just feeling nostalgic, but we all decided to start playing in the mountains again. We decided to make another secret base. But this time around, we were more physically capable, and we planned our builds a lot better. By the time autumn came around, we had built walls, places to sit, etc. When winter arrived, we had a roof, but the cold weather halted our progress. We got less and less done each week. It grew colder and colder by the day, and my friend had an idea to combat the cold. He suggested that we set a bonfire to keep warm. When I think back on it now, what a terrifying idea we had to set a fire in a dry season alone in the mountains. We weren't thinking straight. I gathered a load of dead leaves and branches, and my friends dug a hole. We dumped all the leaves and branches in and set fire. The warmth was a welcome distraction from building. We were chatting and stoking the fire. About ten minutes passed. We were still there chatting by the crackling fire when we heard some rustling. It sounded like someone's footsteps. I have to reiterate that we were really deep into the mountains. It dampened our mood a little. It was creepy. We kicked a load of soil over the fire and made sure it was extinguished. We didn't want to get in trouble. Then the rustling sound intensified. We turned our heads to see someone dressed in a white costume running towards us at a tremendous speed. One of my friends gave the order, run, and we did. We ran as fast as we could down that mountain. We all stood around each other at the bottom, out of breath, asking each other what we thought that was. Then I remembered that we left all our belongings up there. A lot of the stuff had our names and our school information on it. If that was found, who knows what might happen. We spoke about what to do, and we guessed that the person in white was someone who lived nearby and was just probably trying to scare us off. It took a lot of convincing, but we decided to go back and retrieve our belongings. It was stressful heading up that mountain again, not knowing what could be up there waiting for us. We arrived back at our base, and the base was completely intact. We found all of our stuff, left untouched. We were in good spirits, it seemed as if we had got off light. Then a friend called us over to the base. There was a noose slung in our base, as if it was some chilling warning. We never went back. We abandoned our secret base. None of us ever wanted to meet the person in white. Often when we meet up, we talk about that day. Stay out of the mountains. This happened about five or six years ago. My grandfather lives in a mountainous area of Miyazaki Prefecture. I used to visit him every summer vacation. It was really great. I loved playing in the river by his house, going fishing, amongst other things. The summer in question, I had been in the river swimming for about an hour. I started to get cold so I got out and sat on one of the jutting rocks above the river. I loved it because it was like my own private river. There were never usually people around. But that day, I noticed two children about 200 meters away. Even though they were quite far away, I was sure that they were elementary school kids like me. I didn't know that there was a school in the area. The only school I knew about 
was now in ruins. I didn't know about any other kids my age in the area either. It wasn't exactly a well-populated area. They disappeared off in another direction. I thought I'd better get going soon. My parents would be looking for me. I was drying myself off and changing back into my clothes when I noticed something nailed to one of the nearby trees. It was a laminated photo with some text below. The photo was of a woman and two children either side of her. She appeared to be their mother. Below the photo, there was only one line of text. I am looking for these children. It was a bit off-putting. I felt a bit creeped out by this poster in the mountainous woods. The strangest thing about the poster was the fact that the mother's face had been scribbled over with black magic marker. The children's faces had been circled by a red marker. Why would the mother's face be blacked out? Surely she would want to be identified. Surely she would want to be identified if she was the one looking for the children. Something didn't sit right with me about this poster. I mean, this is deep in the mountain woods. It took about 20 minutes to walk to get to this river from my grandfather's house. And he lives in a very unpopulated area. Weirder still, one of the kids in the poster had a unique hairstyle which made him recognisable. And one of the kids I saw by the river today had the same hairstyle. Close cropped, shaven hair. Things are weird. I wanted to get out of there. So I jogged back to my grandfather's house. And I asked my grandfather about the weird poster. He didn't know anything about some missing kids. Strange. Like I said, the village he lives in is small and it's a close-knit community. The fact that he hadn't heard about any missing kids was certainly surprising. Something seemed wrong. Later in the year, my family and I went to visit my grandfather again, to ring in the new year. He was having a drink, and the poster came up in conversation. He said he found something similar to the poster that he was sure I would be interested in. I wasn't sure if interested would be the right word. Maybe creeped out was better. He passed a piece of paper to me. I wonder why he saved it. I was really curious now. It was the same poster as last time, except there was something written over the photo. The word FOUND in bright red ink. I was really creeped out by this. I took it to a local temple, and I asked the priest to say a prayer for these children. You know, just in case. I have no idea if this poster is an innocent thing or something far more sinister. All I know is that the kids looked like they were hiding, and that there's something dark about this situation. Who puts a poster up in the middle of the woods looking for children without asking the locals and blacking out their mother's photo? Who did they think would see this poster in the woods? Was it their mother looking for them, or was it someone else? Were the kids some kind of cult escapees? I think about this all the time. There is something going on in the mountains. Not too long ago, I went for a drive with some of my friends. We were driving around until late night. It tends to be foggier in the mountains, and that's where we were. We wanted to go to the observatory area, near the top of the mountain. I can't remember why we wanted to go, but we did. I realized that a jeep had started following us. It was coming up behind us really fast. One of my friends in the back pointed this out to me, and requested, in some colorful language, for me to speed up. I was more than happy to do so. It was a Mercedes-Benz G-Class, which is the one that basically looks like a Jeep. This thing was way more suited to these mountain roads than my little car. It was really stressful with that behind, and closing the gap with every second. Plus the fog. Plus my friends freaking out in the back. Luckily, I spotted the turn into the observatory. I would soon be out of the road for that thing to pass, if indeed that is why they were tailing me. I turned in, hoping the bends would keep going straight, but it didn't. It pulled in and blocked the exit. I knew that whatever was going to come next wasn't going to be good. I sat in the driver's seat with sweat running down my forehead, telling my friends to keep calm and to keep the doors locked. Agonizing seconds turned into minutes, then a couple of figures emerged from the bends. We were just sat there muttering to one another, 
pretending to be less frightened than we were. Finally, the two men approached us. They were wearing crisp and clean suits. They looked really professional. I guess that's the best way I could describe them. A slender man who wore glasses rapped on my driver's side window, and I lowered it about ten centimeters. What are you doing out here this time of night? He asked very directly. Oh, we were thinking of going to check out the night view here, I mumbled. His friend, who looked in really great shape, snorted at this. Bunch of guys coming out here at this hour to look at a view on a foggy night, huh? These guys looked like they were part of the Yakuza. You know why we followed you, right? I shook my head like a child. Come on, you guys driving around out here, up to no good, no doubt. We thought you might be one of us. Don't worry, you boys are alright. This is just a misunderstanding. There was a collective sigh of relief resonating in our car. We were at ease. We actually had a couple of cans of coffee from the vending machine together, and we had a chat with a smoke. I knew these guys were 100% Yakuza at this point. After a while, the guy with the glasses said, We better be going. We got something we gotta do. They were perfectly nice guys. They got back into their car, and I expected them to pull away, but they didn't. Their car just stayed there, blocking the only exit. We were starting to get nervous again, but then after about three or four minutes, their engine started up, and they disappeared from sight, going up the road into the mountains rather than back the way we came. I didn't know if there was anything at the top of the mountain, but my business wasn't where they were going. I was just glad that we were leaving. Now that we were pretty sure we weren't about to have any conflict with the Yakuza, we began to laugh about the situation and tell one another how scared we were. Well, nearly all of us were laughing. One of my friends remained quiet. His face was pale. It was as if he had seen a ghost. I noticed this and asked him directly if he was okay. His reply shocked me. I, uh, saw something? I pressed him to go on. The car was silent. When that big guy opened that back seat door, I got a glimpse of inside the jeep. There was a guy with tape over his mouth and his arms behind his back. They were up to something. I know for a fact that there is nothing but empty forest land in those mountains. None of us wanted to say what we thought was going to happen to that man, but I guess we were all thinking the same thing. I called the police, but without a license plate, I couldn't give them much to go on. I really don't know why my friend didn't memorize it if he saw that man in distress on the back seats. I think about this incident all the time. Be careful on the mountain roads at night. I think this happened about three years ago. I was on a solo camping trip at the time. It was during summer vacation. I had loaded my mountain bike up with all that I would need, and then I just set off. Things were going well, until my bike got caught in a dip, and I was thrown face first onto the jagged mountain rocks. I thought I had broken my goddamn nose, but thankfully I hadn't. But my bike had blown a flat tire. I had to repair it. I thought about turning back at this point, but but I didn't want to let a little mishap beat me so early into the camping trip. I'm quite a stubborn person. So I kept going for another 10 kilometers or so, and then my tire started to deflate again. Did I not repair it right? I wondered as I came to a stop. I fixed it again and I was back on the road. The tire held for another two hours, and by then I had arrived at the campsite. One problem there. The campsite was closed. Feeling totally let down and dumb for not checking, as well as nursing what I thought was a broken nose, I was still somehow determined not to be beaten. I knew that there was a small stream up ahead of the campsite, and I intended to camp that night. The stream was close by a cedar forest and a bamboo grove. It seemed as good a place as any to camp. So I set up my tent, made stew for dinner, and then went to sleep pretty early. I was tired and hurting. I suddenly woke up to the sound of rustling outside the tent. It was about half past one in the morning. 
there wasn't a full moon out that night, but enough moonlight to see the shadow of the trees swaying in the breeze reflecting on the tent. There was also a small gap to allow air to come in. I didn't zip the tent up completely. I thought that rustling sound could have been a raccoon or something, but whatever was out there sounded a lot faster than a raccoon. I could hear it moving through the bamboo grove. It sounded like it was gradually moving towards the tent. I heard small rocks and stones scatter with each footstep of whatever was approaching. Then it began making this strange sound, almost like a bark. I've never heard a sound in nature anything like that. I saw a silhouette appear through the gap in the tent. It was bashing through the trees and getting closer. I could see it now. It looked humanoid in shape. It had thick hair all over its body. The shadow approached, and I heard its hair drag across the thin fabric of the tent. There was nothing I could do. I just trembled in my sleeping bag and sang a song in my head and waited for whatever was out there to bust through my tent. I kept my eyes as tightly shut as possible, and then after about 15 minutes or so, I couldn't hear anything outside anymore. I stayed up till the morning light, with my torch clamped in my hands. It was the only available thing I had which could come close to a weapon. When the morning light fell upon the tent, I emerged to see if anything had happened to my bike or the things I had left outside. My tire was flat again, and the stew pot was missing. I only ate about half of the stew I had made last night, so I guess that could have been whatever attracted that thing to me. I looked around the area and found my stew pot hanging from a tree branch, about four foot high up. It was also weird, but it was about to get weirder. When I went to pack my things away, I stopped in my tracks. There was a small handprint on the outside of the tent. It was small and reddish brown, no bigger than the size of a bottle cap. If anyone has any ideas what that was, I'm all ears. It still scares me to this day. This happened when I was about seven years old, when I was at school. At that time, my classmate and I used to play in a mountain park. From our houses, it takes about 30 minutes by bicycle to get to the mountain. It only takes about 10 minutes to get to the summit. It's a pretty small mountain. Halfway up the mountain is a park, and at the summit, there is a shrine. There is a village by the mountain. The area is popular with the elderly and families who enjoy forest walks. It gets really busy during vacation times. The park is usually very busy. My friends and I loved the park halfway up the mountain because it wasn't like an everyday neighborhood park. It had some really nice play equipment there. We would play until the sun set each night. One day in autumn, we were playing in that park, just me and my female classmate, who we will call M. She invited me to climb to the top of the mountain. I knew that there was just a small shrine at the top, and it didn't seem as fun as all the great equipment in the park, like the slides and the sandpits, so I asked, why do you want to go to the top? She said that there was a small forest behind the shrine, and she had heard that there was an owl there. She wanted to see if she could find it. It was after five o'clock. The sun was going down. It was already beginning to get dark. My curfew was six o'clock. I didn't know if I could make it back in time, but M had her heart set on finding that owl. I knew her well. She was always on the edge of a tantrum, so instead of arguing, I thought... Let's just go there quick and get back quick. It only took about five minutes to get to the summit anyway. Because it was getting late, there was no one around in the park or on the mountain trails. The forest which M wanted to go to so badly was surrounded by a vermilion fence. The tall trees of the forest swayed in silence. It looked pretty creepy. I wanted to go home. M ran towards the forest with an excited grin turning back to yell, I found the entrance, come on! What she had found was a point in the fencing which had collapsed. Well, it was probably broken by someone. 
Beyond the broken red fencing was twisted barbed wire. I knew deep down that there was something wrong with this situation. I'm sure any other kid my age would have thought the same. We weren't supposed to go in there. Em didn't seem phased. She just crept past the barbed wire and through the gap in the smashed fence. Hey, stop, Em. It's dangerous. We should go home before it gets too late. I would pipe up with things like that. We came this far. I'm not going back now. Come on. She called. I couldn't persuade her to turn back. So with trepidation, I followed her into the forest. It was officially dark. The village below looked gloomy. In the forest, there were these huge piles of fallen leaves. I remembered that they looked tall and bouncy. The ground was rough and uneven, with plenty of pitfalls and holes. I felt as if we were going to fall down one any second. We were walking no longer than ten minutes into the woods. Em was in front, and she stopped and pointed at something. Hey, there's a house there. Why is a house in the woods? I wondered. It was a bit unnerving. I pleaded with her to turn back. Let's go have a look, Em said with a wry smile. She started marching towards the house. We arrived on the right-hand side of the house. It was made of wood, more of a cabin than a house, I realized. As we got closer, we saw no signs that it was inhabited. It seemed empty. I was tired of walking at this point. Em ran off ahead. I couldn't give chase. I was observing the building from the outside when I heard her scream. Are you okay? I called to Em. I ran in the direction I heard her scream. A few seconds later, I heard her shriek again. The first thing I saw was M's shadow. I could tell that she was shivering with fear. Then I saw her approaching, sniffling and sobbing. What happened? I yelled. She said nothing. She slowly raised her finger and pointed at the house. I looked in that direction and saw something terrifying. There was a huge amount of broken and smashed up dolls, their necks broken, their faces smashed. There were these stone monuments called jizos, which were also destroyed. All these strange objects had been weathered and worn. They must have been collected and left there. Someone was building a collection. I stood there, unable to move, goosebumps sprinting up my body. Then, from behind me, I heard a rustling sound like the sound of leaves being trodden on. We both simultaneously turned our heads in the direction of the sound. M said in a quiet and frightened voice, Someone's coming. The crunching sound of leaves was getting closer. We couldn't move. We had no place to run. We stared at each other, shivering. Run! M shouted. It echoed through the silence along the mountaintop. She grabbed my hand and I ran with her. She was pulling me along the uneven road. I nearly tripped. It was so stressful. As we ran, I still heard that crunching on leaves sound coming from behind. What the hell was chasing us? I was frightened, but curious. This morbid curiosity forced me to turn my head to look back as we ran. I turned and saw a huge silhouette of a person, head to toe in black robes running as fast as they could towards us. I was so scared, I couldn't take my eyes off of the figure behind us. I turned back to look in the direction we were running. In that instance, I connected with something sharp and extremely painful. It was the barbed wire wrapped around the red fencing, the point that we entered that horrible little forest. I cut my forehead so deeply, it was agony. I screamed in pain. I had to stop for a second. I put my hand to the wound, and when I pulled it back, it was slick with my blood. They're still chasing us, Em shouted. I fell to the ground. I thought I was going to pass out. Em grabbed my hand and yanked me to my feet and pulled me towards the exit. I could see the panic in her eyes as she glanced at me and then towards the person running at us. We hobbled through the gap in the red fencing and ran towards the village below. After that, we got home safely, but it was after 8 o'clock, way beyond my curfew. That wasn't my biggest problem, though. My parents went crazy about the huge gash in my forehead. 
16 years later, and I still bear the scars to this day. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of that day and how lucky Em and I were to escape. Something strange is definitely going on in the woods behind that shrine.